Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to this Academy for Teachers Masterclass on Civil Rights in the Preamble with Yahuru Williams. I'm Ebony Fuzzy Moore, and I've been teaching at Bronx Leadership Academy 2 High School for about 15 years now. Um, I love what I do because the Bronx produces some of the most, um, the brightest, most innovative, creative young people we know. Um, and it, it really is a privilege to get to work with and learn from them each day. I must not get that. Hold on one second, guys. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I am a proud fellow of the Academy for Teachers, an organization that honors the forever learner in my colleagues and me. Um, I always leave these classes feeling smarter, recharged, and most importantly, seen and ready to get to work. Um, I have the honor of introducing Yahuru Williams. Yahuru is the Distinguished University Chair, Professor of History, and founder, Founding Director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. When I saw the description for this masterclass, I knew it would be something special that I needed to be a part of. Um, as a Black American, a woman, an educator who was alive during a time that I know will be written in the history books as a turning point, um, what better text to ground this work in than the preamble. Um, but Yahuru is not the only star of this masterclass. It's also my honor to introduce the almost 20 teachers here today who were selected from many applicants. Um, it is an impressive group with advanced degrees in law, history, Holocaust and genocide studies, education, Pan-African studies, and special education. They teach grades four through 12 in public, charter, and independent schools. <clears throat> excuse me, through courses like US history, the history of American education, African dance, civics, world languages to world religions. Each day we show up for students both in person and remotely so they know learning is also essential. And those are just the credit bearing courses. The extracurricular list looks like something you'd see at a major university. Um, from student government to student newspaper and podcasting clubs, the Black Student Union, debate teams, sports, the list goes on and on. Um, there's a lot of teaching experience here today. We've been in the classroom between two and 35 years. The total number of years we've been teaching is 304. We teach between 30 and 210 kids. The number of children who know our names is 1,500, and that's just from this year alone. So the real audience today, Yuhuru, is those 1,500 kids, because every teacher here will in some way share with them what we learned from you. Um, the ripple effect of a masterclass is huge. So thank you, Dr. Williams, for being here. Thanks to my fellow teachers for teaching. And with that, let the masterclass begin. Yuhuru, take it away. Thank you, Ebony. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I've been looking forward to this, and I think we are going to have a great conversation tonight. So. But I will tell you that this is in two parts. So tonight, we'll kind of look at some of the foundations and then next week, it'll be deeper into the civil rights uh, part of this uh, conversation. Uh, but I wanna begin with you tonight um, by talking a little bit about how I'd like to order this. And as I mentioned tonight, we'll talk a lot about the preamble. Next week, I'd like to introduce you to the Lewis Doctrine, a different way of thinking about teaching civil rights using Congressman John Lewis's uh, final letter to the American people which will dovetail with some of the things that we talk about tonight. So I just want us to think about that um, in, a, in a broader sense. But at the same time, I, I wanna share some wisdom from uh, Lyndon Johnson, my favorite president who once said, did you ever think that making a speech on economics is a lot like pissing down your leg? It seems hot to you, but it never does to anyone else. I often feel like that sometimes when I present uh, on history topics, I hope this is gonna be exciting to you. It's certainly exciting to me. Um, but judging from all of your bios and backgrounds, I think this is going to be a great uh, masterclass in conversation. Having said that, let's get into it. So I want to begin with some conventional wisdom from James Baldwin, who said, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. Based on what you shared in your descriptions back to the academy, I don't think that um, you're gonna learn anything that'll be earth shaking or earth shatteringly new today. However, I do wanna change the way that we're thinking about our contemporary moment through the lens of the preamble and through the lens of civil rights history. I think there's some tremendous opportunity there to help us reimagine the way that we get young people to think about the significance of this moment. 
And I want to do that again through the vehicle of the preamble to the Constitution, because we all know when we talk about our civil theology, when we think about American core democratic values, um, no one ever says, look for those in Article 1, Section 8 of the US Constitution. We find those in the aspir aspirational language that's articulated in the Declaration of Independence and in the preamble. This language which we can read so much meaning into, which invites um, us to interrogate um, each and every line. We the people, um, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. And all of those invite us to ask significant questions about what they mean. Um, and I think that's important as well. Uh, for our law professor, our law um, uh, person who's with us today, I love this because this goes back to Holmes and Brandeis. And you know, it's, it's not the, um, the law, but the, the living word that we have to interpret. And so that also becomes part of our conversation as well. What I wanna talk about with you tonight is this idea of analyzing the development of a unique American culture. I called it a civil theology earlier and explaining how our ideas, values, beliefs, and traditions have changed, changed over time and how we assume that they should continue to unite us as Americans. Now, 2020 and 2021 have been interesting because that tension is real in our contemporary moment. And then secondly, I'm talking about just a little bit the evolution of American democratic values and beliefs as expressed in those core uh, democratic um, core documents and how we continue to interpret those um, in our contemporary moment. And so I would be remiss. I don't think there's any way to talk about any of this without talking about it in the context of where we are now and talking about it in the context of January 6th. And I wanna do this purposefully because in a lot of ways, I think our students were looking at January 6th and asking some significant questions about where the nation was. And yet I was getting a lot of feedback from teachers who said, I'm uncomfortable teaching this. I don't wanna to touch this. Um, the nation is fragmented. There's so much discourse about Black Lives Matter, so much discourse about um, immigration, so much dis discourse about so much. This just seems to me that it's gonna invite trouble. And yet at the same time, I feel compelled to say something about this because as a civics teacher, as a social studies teacher, as an American history teacher, this is significant what we're witnessing. Now, I, I share that with you because in a way, it would be impossible for us not to talk about this, but I wanna talk about at least one strategy related to this. And I, I, I like to frame it this way. We should sometimes think about teaching by proxy and commenting by proximity. There's a way to talk about the importance and significance of January 6th without necessarily talking about it in the context of January 6th and to comment on our contemporary moment without inviting the critique that we're being political because we're talking about what's in the news cycle when in fact we're talking about some real tensions around American core democratic values, about we the people, who is a citizen, what rights we have, what redress we have, so on and so forth. And I don't wanna lose you here in saying that, but I wanna um, spend some time talking about this because when we think about the symbols that the protesters, the insurrectionists, whatever you wanna call, call them, took to the US Capitol, they by their very nature invite us to interrogate what they mean in the context of our broader history. Let's just talk about two of them, the Confederate flag and the noose, both of which are fairly universally um, defined as symbols either of racial terror in the case of the noose or of separation in the case of the Confederate flag. In fact, if we think about them, at least in terms of how uh, the African-American community would see them. And again, I'm not being political. I'm using the, the, uh, the, the symbols that were used on that day. When we think about the Confederate flag, we think immediately about the Confederacy. When we think about lynching, look at this very disturbing political cartoon from the German press during the Second World War. And it depicts the United States. Um, number one, note the anti-Semitism in the cartoon but it depicts the United States where outcomes in the justice system for African-Americans are either lynching or capital punishment. Um, it's really hard then to deny that we have to unpack those symbols and their meaning in the context of the contemporary moment and also how they tie to our broader history. And when we do that, we have to understand that as all of you do, that if we're gonna talk about the Confederacy, when people say, well, the Confederate flag is simply a symbol of of heritage, of Southern heritage. Uh, it's a symbol of Southern pride, right? There's no way to decouple that from what we know to be the core message growing out of the Confederate States of America. 
which is articulated by Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy on March 21st, 1861. What does Alexander Stevens say that the Civil War is about? What does he say the Confederate, uh, Confederacy's foundations are laid on? He begins by saying, our argument isn't with the Constitution. In fact, he begins, the Constitution secured every essential guarantee to the institution, slavery, while it should last. And, to, and hence, no argument can be justly urged against the constitutional guarantees thus secured because of the common sentiment of the day. So he says, you know, the, 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 the sentiments in the nation changed and our, our beef wasn't with the constitution, it was with those changing sentiments. And he goes on, those ideas, those changing sentiments, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. This was an error. It was a sandy foundation and the government built upon it fell when the storm came and the wind blew. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This our new government is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. Now, when we read that and we think about that in the context of what we saw on January 6th, it's important to recognize that that's what the Confederate flag has come to symbolize. And what's really powerful about that, at least in the context of our contemporary moment, is then asking ourselves as educators, how do we get students to ask those questions or interrogate the meaning of those symbols in the same way that a historian would do? I think about one of my favorite books, which is James McPherson's book, What They Fought For, which was published in 1995. And what I love about McPherson here, and you all know this, um, it, it's true, is he's just really good because most historians who are really, really great historians are really great because they ask really great questions. I love this as an exercise in teaching young people about how to think critically. I love it as an exercise in writing. But I, I just want to share with you um, the beginning of chapter two from this book and what McPherson does, because I think the questions that he asks in that moment about that history are applicable today in a very interesting way. And again, we're teaching by proxy, we comment by proximity. So what does McPherson do here that, that Yuhuru likes so much? He begins by uh, showing students the sausage being made. One of the questions he begins often asked a civil, civil war historian is, why did the North fight? Southern motives seem easier to understand. Confederates fought for independence, for their own property and way of life, for their very survival as a nation. But what did the Yankees fight for? Why did they persist through four years of the bloodiest conflict in American history, costing 360,000 Northern lives, not to mention 260,000 Southern lives, an untold destruction of resources? Now, I love this because um, He's a, almost a paragraph in and all he's done is ask some really compelling questions. And you know how sometimes when we're struggling to get our students to think about a research paper or a research topic and we say, but what's the question that you wanna answer? I love this because our good friend James McPherson is modeling how you ask really good questions. Hasn't offered any answers yet, but good questions should lead to additional questions. He then uses evidence here, I think very in a compelling way. Puzzling over this question in 1863, Confederate War Department clerk John Jones wrote in his diary, our men must prevail in combat or lose their property, country, freedom, everything. On the other hand, the enemy in yielding the contest may retire into their own country and possess everything they enjoyed before the war began." End quote. McPherson picks up, if that was true, why did the Yankees keep fighting? And then McPherson hints to us where we can find the answers to that. And he lists off a bunch of documents here. And Abraham Lincoln's notable speeches, the Gettysburg Address, his first inaugural, um, his message to Congress on December 1st, 1862. But then he says, it's not just looking at the presidents. We also have to interrogate this from the perspective of ordinary Americans who fought that war, who suffered through that contest, who were deeply impacted by what played out in those four years and beyond. And he says, but we can find even more of those answers in the wartime letters and diaries of the men who did the fighting. Confederates who said they fought for the same goals as the forebearers of 1776 would have been surprised by the intense conviction on, of the Northern soldiers that they were upholding the legacy of the American Revolution. It's that conflict in a way that we saw on January 6th 
it's that conflict that we've seen um, in American history over time that gives us an opportunity to interrogate that again from the perspective of those symbols. Now the noose, think about what Ida B. Wells argued with regard to lynching as a punishment. What were African-Americans lynched for? What were people lynched for? Um, we could think about the work of William Kerrigan who does work on lynching not only of African-Americans but Mexican-Americans. Um, we can think about the fact that of the, uh, the, the work done by the Tuskegee Institute in documenting lynchings, talked about the brutality visited upon black men, women, and children. And for what? Ida B. Wells lays it out in Lynch Law in America from 1900 for all kinds of offenses and for no offenses, from murders to misdemeanors, men and women are put to death without judge or jury. So that although the political excuse was no longer necessary, the wholesale murder of human beings went on just the same. I gotta say this to you in this moment because you can hear echoes in a powerful way of Black Lives Matter in Ida B. Wells from 1900. It's not using that language. But ultimately, if we wanna make that connection, clearly what Ida B. Wells was saying was, there needs to be some protection for black life against the, the, this extra legal violence, which is rampant in the United States from this period from 1900 to roughly 1930, where you have double digit lynchings in most of the Southern states every year. And in some states where you wouldn't expect any, um, any such violence, very few states in the union are spared the stain of lynching. I don't wanna lose you here, but I wanna be clear that when we think about this and how it maps to our contemporary moment, there was a great political cartoon that was put out a couple of years ago. Actually, this is more than um, 10 years ago now. Uh, and it shows Mumia Abu-Jamal and he's pictured between uh, a gentleman in a white robe and a gentleman in a black robe, clearly the Ku Klux Klan and the criminal justice system. And the cartoonist calls this um, the history of American lynching. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that this demands some historical knowledge. It demands us to interrogate the meaning here because the cartoonist is playing on two really powerful uh, streams in US history. You have to be familiar with really to unpack this. And you know, it, it ends up where you're looking at the Ku Klux Klan and one can make the argument here, if you're looking at this cartoon, that whether the injustice comes at the hands of men who wore robes and hoods to commit their crimes because in the aftermath of the Civil War, during Reconstruction, in the aftermath of the um, passage of the Enforcement Act of 1870, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, they had reason to fear that they would be prosecuted for taking a life. Then those robes and hoods were necessary. Or if you think about it in a contemporary context, whether that injustice comes at the hands of people who wear black robes and it comes as a result of a criminal justice system, which, and look, I'm not gonna push this all the way. I just wanna raise the question in a way that I think is compelling, that as we think about the way that we can connect this to our contemporary moment, it becomes very powerful in thinking about those symbols from January 6th, and inevitably the questions that our students must have been asking or still asking about what this means. One of the people who can kind of pull this together for us, who can help us make that connection I was trying to make earlier about the world changing according to the way people see it. If you can alter by a millimeter the way they look at reality, you can change it, is Thurgood Marshall. I love what Thurgood Marshall said two years after Brown versus Board of Education is there's massive resistance to Brown being implemented in the South. And here's Thurgood Marshall in September of 1958, post Little Rock, kind of uh, meditating on the meaning of that moment, the meaning of Brown versus Board of Education, the meaning of, of ending separate but equal and why all this was necessary. And Marshall begins, look, we got it wrong. Education is not the teaching of the three R's. It's not about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Education is the teaching of overall citizenship. To learn to live together with fellow citizens and above all, I love this, to learn to obey the law. I do not know of any more horrible destruction of the principle of citizenship, listen carefully, than to tell young children in Little Rock that those of you who withdrew, rather than go to school with black children, come back, all is forgiven, you win. Therefore, I'm not worried about Negro children in these states. I worry about the white children in Little Rock who are told as young people that the way to get your rights is to violate the law and defy the lawful authorities. 
I'm worried about their future. I don't worry about the Negro kid's future. Listen carefully to what he says here. They've been struggling with democracy long enough. They know about it. So what's really powerful for me here is that Marshall frames this as fundamentally a question of citizenship and a frustration of democracy. Remember, we said we teach by proxy, we comment by proximity. It's interesting what he forecasts about the future here, about lawlessness and the way that people will see a dichotomy and the way that people are treated. But I also think that what's powerful about it is that he's talking about it in relation to a historical episode, Little Rock, that for all intents and purposes, when he talks about struggling with democracy long enough, think about our contemporary moment, think about the last year, think about George Floyd, think about Colin Kaepernick, think about Black Lives Matter, think about all the conversations that we had um, over the last two years about voting rights, think about conversations about mass incarceration. If you live in New York, think about conversations about criminal justice, uh, think about... What's really powerful about that is that they in many ways resemble very much what we saw in Little Rock in 1957. In fact, I often like to situate my co uh, co conversations about this through young voices, because I think if you can get young voices to comment, it's a way for young people to be able to see in themselves that they're not powerless in this moment and to recognize as John Lewis talked about, and as I talked about in that article um, from John Lewis, that many people in history have stood in your shoes and have faced the same challenges. It's what we can learn from them that ultimately empower us to make decisions to move forward, to act. The youngest of the Little Rock Nine is Melba Patilla Beals. She's 12, 13 years old when those nine children are uh, tapped to um, be the pioneers and de uh, desegregate Central High. And her mother tells her in the midst of this that she's making history, she's living history and she should keep a diary. I love telling young people this story because I wanna be clear. You know, there's nothing that Melba Patilla Beals maybe perhaps recognizes that this is a big moment, but in that moment, her mom's saying, you're living through history. This is really important. You wanna record this, you're gonna to wanna to remember this. And so she does that, um, follows her mom's um, advice. And it's this diary that ultimately will become the basis of her book, Warriors Don't Cry. And we have her intimate thoughts that she was going through as she was um, uh, participating in this monumental um, civil rights victory that we talk about, which was also quite tumultuous for her and for the nation in that moment. Now, there are two points I wanna make about this very quickly. Number one, I love to use this because I love to encourage young people to write and to journal and to keep diaries. And I love this because just a few slides ago, I shared with you that McPherson said, hey, we can learn about a lot from what presidents say, but it's also the diaries and the letters of ordinary soldiers who did the fighting that matter. And I love this because here's young uh, Melba Patilla Beals who gives us the most intimate window into what it felt like. in 1957, 58. Listen to what she writes, you're gonna love this. How strange I thought to be involved in something the whole nation considers among its 10 most important stories. If it's that important, you'd think somebody would do something to make the Central High students behave themselves. Is it that nobody cares or nobody knows what to do? Out of the mouth of the child, it's just By New Year's Eve, I only thought about Central High perhaps every other hour. So on New Year's Eve, 1958, I sat home completing my list of New Year's resolutions. Number one, to do my best to stay alive until May 29th. What's May 29th? Anybody? Last day of school. Yeah, cool. Last day of school, end of the school year. So here's Melba Patilla Beals. Like we, we talk about this just in terms of being a great document and being able to and I see a lot of young people post January 6th thinking about the pandemic, thinking about the protests in the street, thinking about what we witnessed. And Melba Patilla Beals is a good window into, follow me, I'm not done with her yet. Number two, to pray daily for the strength not to fight back. We sometimes forget that these young people under Daisy Bates, the woman who was in charge of the, of the uh, uh, Arkansas NAACP, we sometimes read out the role of women. 
Women play a significant role in the civil rights movement. And although they're often not heralded, the fact of the matter is it was Daisy Bates who was ultimately um, responsible for getting these young people in a position that they understood that what they were undertaking was bigger than the classes they were gonna take at Central High. This was about being stewards for a movement. And that nonviolence was critical to that as a strategy and tactic. So they spent that summer before integrating Little Rock High reading the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, studying Mahatma Gandhi. I love this because if there's ever any practical example I wanna give young people about why humanities matter, why history matters, why this is so important, Melba just gave it to me. She continues, to keep faith and understand more how Gandhi behaved when his life was really hard, to help be, uh, to behave in ways that please mother and grandmother, to maintain the best attitude I can at school, to help grandma India with her work, to help Minnie Jean remain in school and to be a better friend to her. It's a phenomenal document of a 13 year old girl in the midst of the biggest news story in her moment that these are the things that she's concerned about. These are the things that she's thinking about that give us a window into the movement. They give us a window into what she's going through. But I think in a very um, compelling way, help young people understand their place in our contemporary moment. Don't lose me here, but it's not just those young voices. It's also looking at Little Rock as an exercise in presidential power to ensure domestic tranquility, to enforce the law. So we think about the way that this plays out in Little Rock, right? You've got Governor Faubus who calls out the National Guard to prevent those nine students from entering Central High. And then the very next day, President Eisenhower nationalizes the Guard to protect the same students from those poor guardsmen, what they must have been going through, which Melba gives us when she says, this is among the nation's 10 most important stories. How come somebody can't do something to make those students behave? Look, I, I love this because at the core, what Melba, what Governor Faubus, what the white David Eisenhower, what Daisy Bates, what Martin Luther King, what the people in Arkansas named and unnamed, familiar and unfamiliar to us are all dealing with are the core democratic values that the National Social Council for the Social Studies says are essential to our understanding of democracy, but which are always under tension to some degree and always in play. Life, each citizen has the right to the protection of their life. But the question is, is that protection of your life as in stand your ground laws? or Black Lives Matter. The pursuit of happiness. Each citizen can find happiness in their own way as long as they don't infringe on the rights of others. So what does that mean for bathrooms in North Carolina? Liberty, freedom to believe what you want, freedom to choose your own friends, to express your ideas and opinions in public, the right for people to meet in groups and the right to have any lawful job or all of these things in some sorts are always, all, always under attention, always in play. And again, Melba uh, Patilla Beals and Little Rock are giving us a way to talk about January 6th without talking about January 6th. Could we only do this with Melba Patilla Beals? Absolutely not. You could do this if you were talking about the Pullman strike um, and George Pullman in the 1890s. You could do this around Haymarket. You could do this around the Bonus Army. You could do this around the Ford strike. You could do this around um, the women's movement. You could do this around any number of other moments in our history were literally those core justice. All people should be treated fairly and getting advantages and disadvantages of our, our country. No group or person should be favored. These are the ideals, but the question is one of you wrote um, in your write up to the academy was, but how, how often do we live up to those ideals? And when we don't, what narrative does it leave for those individuals, for those communities, for those young people? who witness the dichotomy and are left to make meaning of it. Truth, popular sovereignty, the power of government comes from the people. Truth, the government and citizens should not lie. Common good, citizens should work together for the good of all. Equality, diversity, patriotism. We think about all these things and I wanna say to you, and again, this is a conversation between us, not saying I would necessarily do this in class, but we need to talk about this, that it's a study in contrast, Little Rock, in 1957 and the Capitol insurrection of January 6th. 
It's not just a study in contrast in terms of what we saw, it's a study in contrast in terms of executive action. And I'm not being political here, but I want you to think about Eisenhower's response in that moment because Eisenhower recognizes, and keep in mind, Eisenhower is no great friend of the civil rights movement, but Eisenhower also makes the case very eloquently that we fought a civil war around these issues and the North won and the uh, federal government is supreme and we're not gonna fight this again. And we're gonna enforce the, the dictates of the United States Supreme Court and we're not gonna have anarchy in our midst. But Eisenhower doesn't just go through the motions. He delivers this televised speech, September 24th, 1957. And I wanna put him in conversation with Melba here because here Eisenhower speaking to the American people, but I also wanna be clear, speaking to the world because Eisenhower recognizes, and he's gonna say this in the same way in the aftermath of January 6th, we were talking about what the rest of the world was saying about the United States and how other nations were looking at us. And as the condolences were rolling in from the prime minister in Great Britain and, the, and people were saying, what's happening here? It seems like the world is upside down. Eisenhower recognized that this is playing out on not just a national, but a global stage. He begins, proper and sensible observance of the law is demand, um, then demands the respectful ob obedience which the nation has a right to expect from all its people. This unfortunately has not been the case at Little Rock. Certain misguided persons, many of them imported into Little Rock by agitators, have insisted upon defying the law and have sought to bring it to disrepute. The orders of the court have thus been frustrated. I wanna play two games with you here and if I had more time, I'd play the games to a greater um, extent. But I want to be clear that this argument about outside agitators that we always see, whether you're talking about Black Lives protesters or insurrectionists, this is the way that Americans, this is how we deal with, well, it was people from the outside. Secondly, he continues, the very basis of our individual rights and freedoms rest upon the certainty that the president and executive branch will support and ensure the carrying out of decisions of the federal courts, even when necessary with all the means at the president's command unless the president did so, anarchy would result. There would be no security for any except that which he could use, uh, that which he, uh, excuse me, there would be no security for any except that which he, one of us could provide for himself. What do I love about this? I already see it because I saw it in some of the comments that you shared in your um, descriptions. Eisenhower just gave us Hobbes and Locke. Eisenhower just gave us an op opportunity to talk about life in a state of nature being nasty, brutish, and short. And this is why individuals give up liberty and compact to form governments in order to have that. And I love it that he's doing it in an organic sense, responding to a, a, a situation that literally in his mind, he says it in the next sentence, was paramount to deal with in that moment because of the threat to democracy. You know, it's interesting to me because I'd love to make Eisenhower out to be a hero here, but we wanna be nuanced and balanced in the way we think about this. Eisenhower never mentions the nine black children integrating Little Rock High. For Eisenhower, this is all about democracy. Watch where he concludes. The interest of the nation and the proper fulfillment of the law's requirements cannot yield to opposition and demonstrations by some few persons. Mob rule cannot be allowed to override the decisions of the courts. A foundation of American way of life is national respect for law. In the South as elsewhere, citizens are keenly aware of the tremendous disservice that's being done to the people of Arkansas and the eyes of the nation, and that is being done to the nation in the eyes of the world. At a time when we face grave situations abroad because of the hatred that communism bears toward a system of government based on human rights, it would be difficult to exaggerate the harm that is being done to the prestige and influence, indeed to the safety of our nation and the world. This is powerful. And oh, by the way, I'm talking to you about January 6th. I didn't even have to mention January 6th, I think for the astute young people that you teach in your very capable hands to understand the implications of this moment as a way to think about our contemporary moment. Don't wanna lose you here, but he concludes, our enemies are gloating over this incident and using it everywhere to misrepresent our whole nation. We are portrayed as a violator of those standards of conduct which the peoples of the world united to proclaim in the charter of the United, States, United Nations. 
There they affirm faith and fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person. And they did so without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. When John Lewis argues that these are intersections that other people, these are, are, are spaces where other people have, have um, navigated it's important for young people to be able to see that. And 1957 gives us that in a very powerful way. Look, I, I don't have a, a lot of time to deal with, but I want to be clear. Eisenhower does the right thing. And yet for African-Americans, look at um, the response of Jackie Robinson from 1958. Eisenhower is still asking African-Americans to be patient, to go slow. What's Jackie Robinson's response? My dear Mr. President, I was sitting in the audience at the summit meeting of Negro leaders yesterday when you said we must have patience. On hearing you say this, I felt like standing up and saying, oh no, not again. I respectfully remind you, sir, that we've been the most patient of all people. When you said we must have self-respect, I wondered how we could have self-respect and remain patient considering the treatment accorded us through the years. 17 million Negroes cannot do as you suggest and wait for the hearts of men to change. We want to enjoy now the rights which we are entitled to as Americans, the core democratic values that are expressed in the Declaration of Independence and in the preamble as citizens. Melba gave us all of that, but Melba becomes the springboard to talk about how multiple layers of this conversation are taking place in different spaces among, and I wanna be clear because I'm hoping that, that, that we're doing this. I'm not, I, I haven't been very transparent about it to this point. I will be much more so next week that we got athletics in the middle of this with Jackie Robinson. We got young voices. We got the president of the United States. Um, we could have gone other places with that. But my point is to demonstrate that we can teach by proxy, comment by proximity, and still have a really important conversation that needs to be had about the meaning for this in this moment of challenge. And I think Thurgood Marshall also gives us a great way to think about how we deal with the issue of civil rights in our contemporary context by talking about it in the context of struggling with democracy and what that means. Martin Luther King, March of uh, 1965, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, this is before, uh, uh, after, after um, excuse me, this is after Jimmy Lee Jackson is murdered and uh, Martin Luther King eulogizes Jimmy Lee Jackson. What does Martin Luther King say in that moment? It is a powerful speech because Martin Luther King ultimately makes this a commentary, not just on what's happening in the South, he indicts everyone for a lack of action on civil rights. Listen to him, it's remarkable. M much more to me compelling speech than the I have a dream speech if we're thinking about teaching King because it's a king who's asking each of the people that he talks about in this passage what their rights and responsibilities are as citizens and what they need to do in order to address the inequality, the injustice that's taking place in Alabama and throughout the country. He continues, uh, excuse me, he begins, a state trooper pointed the gun, but he did not act alone. Jimmy Lee Jackson was murdered by the brutality of every sheriff who practices lawlessness in the name of law. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician from governors on down, who's fed his constituents to stale bread of hatred and a spoiled meat of racism. He was murdered by the timidity of a federal government that can spend millions of dollars a day to keep troops in South Vietnam and cannot protect the rights of its own citizens seeking the right to vote at home. He was murdered by the indifference of every white minister of the gospel who's remained silent behind the safe security of his stained glass windows. And he was murdered by the cowardice of every black person who passively accepts the evils of segregation and stands on the sidelines in the struggle for justice. King spared no one in this critique of what our rights and responsibilities are vis-a-vis -vis our uh, democracy. In fact, playing this game with you just a little bit, and we're I, we got to take some questions. I'm out of time or close to out of time, so. I'm gonna run through these very quickly, but we do have next week. Give me another example here, Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman to run for president. Um, when people were making a big hullabaloo about Hillary Clinton, a lot of people said, don't forget Shirley Chisholm from the 1970s and we go even further back, but Shirley Chisholm's candidacy um, in the 1970s was pretty important. 
What did Shirley Chisholm say in kind of defining her campaign? She begins, I was the first American, not black woman, not African American, I was the first American citizen. So even Shirley Chisholm recognizes the importance to frame this in terms of citizenship. To be elected to Congress in spite of the double drawbacks of being female and having skin darkened by melanin. When you put it that way, it sounds like a foolish reason for fame. Listen carefully to what she's saying here. In a just and free society, it would be foolish. That I'm a national figure because I was the first person in 192 years to be at once a congressman, black and a woman, proves I think that our society is not either just or free. And looking at these vignettes and talking about struggling with democracy, it makes it bigger than just talking about the difference between the way one set of demonstrators behaved and another set of demonstrators behaved, the way that one set of demonstrators was treated and the way that another set of demonstrators was, were, were treated. It gets at the fundamental question raised by the Kerner Commission of two Americas, separate and unequal. It gets at the core democratic values that the National Council for Social Studies talks about. It gets at this question in the preamble that who are the people when we say we the people? And do those things apply uniformly to, to all citizens? I, I wanna, you know, because we're gonna do this next week, in with you today by talking about um, uh, strategy for doing this called historical fingerprinting. And I'm gonna run through this very, very quickly. We're out of time, so I will do this very fast. Um, I'm gonna skip the um, document there. In fact, we are, I, I wanna take your questions because there's, I'll go down a rabbit hole and I'll be here all day. So let me get to your questions and we will pick up, um, pick up with the presentation next week, so. Fantastic. Uh, shall, we, shall we just ask people to raise their hands and start the conversation that way? That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and use your little Zoom hands. And if you're not regular Zoom participants, you'll find that on, on the reactions icon down at the bottom toolbar of your screen. Maurice, jump in. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Professor Williams. Appreciate you uh, for your presentation. I really was um, moved by this idea of teaching by proxy, commenting by proximity. Um, and in terms of just like the ethics of teaching, it makes perfect sense. I also sometimes wonder how to walk that line because I do think it can be a fine line. Um, and I wonder if there's somewhat of like a litmus test. It's a, it's a great question, Maurice, and that was gonna be the strategy I was gonna share with you. Um, what I would say is, and again, I didn't do a good job of modeling it tonight because I wanted, you know, being very clear with us that we are talking about January 6th. If I were to do that in class, I would have gone in and we're talking about Little Rock today, or we're talking about, as I mentioned, um, I don't ever, and I think all of you probably saw this, I didn't have to make any reference to January 6th for my students to be able to immediately make those. Now, if they raise it and they say, well, isn't this like this, then I'm responding to that question. I also am very clear about sharing with parents what I'm doing. I taught in Washington, DC, it's a very political, you know, um, eighth graders and 11th graders and ninth graders in Washington, DC, very political. And so things would come up and I'd often find myself in a position where if I say the wrong thing, I'm gonna get a bunch of letters tomorrow and have my headmaster, my, my principal upset with me about. So the way that I would always navigate that is what historical intersection could I find that was closest to that issue, and then get my students primed to discuss that through primary sources where people are grappling with essentially the same issue. Little Rock almost works, it's a one-to-one it's a, a -one parallel, but I mentioned a couple of others that you could have done that would have translated just as easy. Um, in, uh, in, in DC, the big issue that people were talking about in that moment was reparation. So I used David Walker's appeal. I mean, that was the big thing and people were polarized about, you know, why are we talking about this? We're talking about Walker's appeal and my students immediately were like, well, isn't that like, absolutely. They've raised that question. Now we're in organic conversation about it. Um, when questions came about what I was teaching, well, I was teaching about David Walker's appeal 
and there are natural parallels. And here are the documents that we looked at. This is why we were discussing it. One of the things that I should have mentioned to you earlier um, that I like to do, I take that preamble, it's my word wall. That's how we begin the year. What are we doing this year? Some of you also said this in your descriptions. We're gonna spend the year talking about this language and what it's meant over time and how it's transformed. We know this because you all teach this, that we the people means one thing in 1789. It's gonna mean something very different in 1830. It's gonna mean something very different in 1870. It's gonna mean very, something very different in 1920. And so that's always my way to go back and that becomes my line. Are we interrogating the evolution of the meaning of these concepts? Can I tie it back to those core democratic values in the National Council for the Social Studies? And most importantly, as McPherson modeled for us and hopefully as I tried to do with you today, can I find primary sources where ordinary people, politicians, people from various walks, and especially young people are all grappling with those issues in a way that organically should have students go, oh, yeah. And hopefully get them to see ways, uh, compel them to see ways that they can take action. And by that, I wanna be very clear. I don't mean that I want students to go out and protest. I mean, journaling. I mean, uh, writing letters, recording what they're experiencing, um, commenting on it, engaging people in conversation about it, processing it in some way, in the way that Melville was, and, a very, and recognizing that the human emotions that go along with that, I'm giving you a long answer, Maurice, that's why you can't, you know, your who is out of control, um, that you, what I love about Melba Patilla Beals is, half that list is about just ordinary stuff that other 13, 14, and 15 year olds are concerned about. I wanna be a better friend than Minnie Jean. I need to clean the house, which I really love, right? I mean, these are the things that she's concerned about, but I also want young people to understand that in that there's a normality that is interrupted by what's happening. And yet that doesn't, uh, you know, she doesn't lose sight of those things in the process of responding. And she's not extraordinary for that. There are other voices that we can find to kind of uh, do that for us as well. Sorry for the long answer. Thank you. No questions either means that. Um, uh, Catherine has a question. Proud of me, or oh, go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> um, so I, uh, this is kind of like question and comment based off of. Um, what y'all are just talking about. So Maurice, we're in the same building. So I'd love to chat with you at some point since we're now gonna be back in the building. Um, I think the whole idea of, um, like I've, I've thought about that, you know, asking students to journal and everything. And this idea of, you know, struggling with democracy long enough, um, I don't wanna push students who feel like they've been struggling with democracy long enough to to have to journal about it and so that's that's a fine line for me always is um where to meet students where they're at and to and maybe journaling allows for that because it allows them to do what they however much or it allows them to be where they're at um so i guess i just yeah i guess i'm wondering uh, what to do when it, it feels like students are like, yeah, I've been learning about this long enough, been struggling with this long enough. And so it's like, I, I don't want to, like, thanks. Melba's our model there too, and Melba's mom. Because what I love about that is that Melba's mom didn't say write about Little Rock. She just said, keep a diary, which I think is wonderful. And she did. And I love that what Melba's mom kind of modeled for her is this idea that, and this is true of all of us right now. I'm working on a book project. Um, with a couple of other historians where we're just kind of thinking, what did you do over the last nine months? Or actually it's been a year now as, we, as we're coming up on a year and just the way that our lives have changed. And 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we'll be looking back and those will be the primary sources that we'll be teaching in class. All of us teach these primary sources now that are you know, people talking about what it was like to, uh, one of my favorite songs is Video Killed the Radio Star. Um, which was the first video that premiered on MTV. What do I love about that? Is that that um, whole song, that whole concept was about how pictures, moving pictures destroyed radio. And within a decade, right? The internet destroyed moving pictures. And within, a, so it's so interesting in that sense, I always tell the joke about, um, I remember 
you know, working out back in the eighties and you'd have a, you know, Walkman and 50 cassettes. And I thought it was so convenient that, you know, you make yourself a 90 minute mixtape and you go for a run. One of my legs is still more developed than the other one because my Walkman was so heavy, right? But the fact of the matter is that it was portable music and it was wonderful. Then the disc man came out. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I threw away my tapes, you know, the filling out the old, get one tape, you know, for a penny, so on and so forth. And, and then it was CDs and now CDs are gone. And, you know, all of us, to, uh, a point of pride for most of us was somebody would walk in your living room and your movie collection would be there. Remember we had these big entertainment centers and now you don't see that anymore. If you see that, it's kind of like a Rolodex, just kidding. Um, so my whole point in raising that, Catherine, is simply this, because I think it's a great question. I never asked kids to journal about um, struggling with democracy. I think that's what um, Melba's mom said is, just keep a journal, but organically, it's what Flannery O'Connor talked about. I don't know what I think until I see what I've written and had a time to process it. And just the process of saying or encouraging young people to put down their thoughts in writing is kind of a great way to get them to deal with some of those things they're thinking about. Um, I use Melba all the time because I, when I talk, because I thought one of the things that I thought was cool about her too is that there's this whole element of the things that she's so concerned about as an educator, as a, as a ninth grade teacher, anti-bullying. I want mini Jean to be a better uh, student. I want to get good grades. I want to do well at home. I mean, there's so much about that that just to me organically is what I imagine young people are thinking about because that's what I was thinking about, but no one ever, I, I don't think I ever would have put that down in a, in a journal. Um, at the same time, I think it's kind of interesting that if we can do it in a way that it doesn't become artificial, and that's what you're talking about, Catherine, and that's the good point. You're not turning it in. I'm not grading you. But if you write something that you think is really compelling and you want to share, you got the space to do that. And I'm encouraging you to do that because I think that your thoughts are important and I want to create a space for you to feel like in the same way that we study these people from history. None of them thought in that moment that what they were writing or saying would be that significant. That's why Melville pushes back. And ultimately, thank goodness that she kept that diary because that becomes for us a very authentic window into what was happening in, in the hallways at Central High. Cheryl Ann, do you want to jump in? Hi, I have a less deep question, but it was something that I was wondering when you pulled up the Jackie Robinson letter, and I'm not sure if I should know this or not, but why was it on chock full of nuts letterhead? Oh, Cheryl Ann, such a great question. Because Yay, Jack, when he left, that's a great, it's a wonderful question. Jackie Robinson, when he retired from baseball, became an executive VP for human resources at chock full of nuts in New York City. On um, that heavenly coffee, um, the coffee only a millionaire could buy. So yeah, that was his post-baseball life. And so that's why it's on chock full and that's at letterhead. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Love talking about Jack. <laughs> Wonderful. Ebony, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. My question is about, um, I guess it, this comes back to the teach by proxy and comment by proximity. Um, so there are, there are, historical figures that we can teach about and there's like no objection to like any kind of you know quality traits personality traits that we put toward them like it's expected and people accept it and it's it's not a problem and it's you know all through global history there are all these figures good and bad that we present to children in that way Right, even in, you know, we have Ivan the Terrible, like in their names, like we, we talk about them in this way. So what is the difference now? Is it just because we're currently living in this that makes it kind of like not something you wanna touch? I, I just, how do you talk about what's happening now um, and be neutral? Like what, what's, the benef what's the benefit of, of that? when you know teaching i don't know i feel like my kids will look at me like miss what like you you know <laughs> like why are you talking about this person in this way like we we know what's really going on so i don't i'm i'm struggling with that it's it's a great question so i'll say three things about that i we live in a very polarized society in which there are you know So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the political answer, then I'll give you the real answer. So the political answer is that I can't tell you the number of times that I have, you know, I was doing a professional development in New York City 
And I was talking about Trump's use of the internet. I did not say anything negative about the president. I was talking about presidential use of technology. And I said, as FDR mastered the radio and it ultimately resulted in um, a political victory for him, understanding and using that medium, the way that Kennedy, we often, we teach that the turning point to a certain extent in that election was Kennedy's uh, appearance on television and how much uh, you know, more youthful and polished he looked on TV than Nixon. And that was, and then I talked about um, Barack Obama's use of social media and how significant that was. And then I said, and in the same way that Donald Trump has been masterful in the use of, and erupting from the back of the room where people were like both sides and just, they couldn't even let me finish to know there was nothing inherently political in anything that I was saying other than, this are, these are ways to get young people to divorce from what they're doing with the media realize that the medium are important, right? So it's the presidential use of radio, of television. And then what's on the horizon? What I'm trying to do is get young people to think critically. And if there's one or two students in my class or 50 students in my class who disagree with me, I don't want that to um, take away from them being able to think critically about what I share, which is why I always step back and I say to them, you don't really know what I think. What I'm asking you to do is to think and to make arguments based on evidence. And if you can make an argument based on evidence that you have, then I'm going to grade you on the evidence that you use and how well you make that argument. Uh, and I do that in certain instances because what I don't want to invite, and you know, this is part of the problem too, and we all deal with it. And I, I your point about Ivan the Terrible is well, well taken, but you've got that distance, that historical distance to be able to make that value determination um, that then you, know, you don't have people kind of coming and saying, you're sharing your politics with the students. Um, now I'll give you the unpolitical answer to that. I, had a, I have a friend who um, just could not contain his disdain for the president and he got his evaluations back and the students were like, I came to learn history. I didn't come to hear how you felt about the president every day and this has nothing to do up, uh, I'm teaching about a moment in history that we witnessed on January 6th that I think 50 years from now will be as important as any chapter that we're talking about now relative to that type of, uh, of, of disturb. We, we will be talking about that. Well, none of us will be around. Well, some of you will be. I'm not going to be on the planet. But um, some people will be around to teach that. And I want young people who remember that to remember that in a way that I remember the OPEC crisis from the 1970s. Um, and I remember that as a young person who made money in the gas lines going to get, you know, my brother and I would wake up early, people would line up at the gas stations. We'd go from car to car and take money from people. We'd run to the corner store and get coffee um, and snacks for them as they waited to get their gas. That's how I, I got money. I never thought about that in a critical way until much later when I was a history teacher and I'm like, man, what an incredible commentary that was on that moment as an inner city young person living in Bridgeport, Connecticut and recognizing that the scarcity of gasoline led to that. And at the time I was completely uncritical about what political situation led to that or, or any of that. In the same way that we don't process, um, and it's such, and Ebony, the reason I'm giving you a long answer is it's such a good question. Theme songs, Archie Bunker, Norman Lear, masterful. Talk about a time capsule. Boy, the way Glenn Miller played, songs that made the hit parade, guys like us, we had it made. Got, but the great thing is that Norman Lear sets Archie Bunker in Queens, not in Birmingham, because he's trying to make the point that don't get comfortable being like, it's that person over here because racism is a national problem. And he does that by situating America's most beloved bigot in New York City, which is really powerful. But then if you stop just with the racial comparison with Archie Bunker, you miss all the other great stuff in the, link, uh, in, in the lyrics. And you knew who you were then, girls were girls and men were men. Mr. We could use a man like Herbert Hoover. All those questions that are laid out in the theme song of that song map neatly to what Eisenhower talked about in his response um, on September 24th mm -hmm. and map neatly to our current conversations about race, class, and gender today. We are in some, and if I can get young people to think critically about that, I think that I'm in a better position then when the critique comes and the critique's gonna come anyway to your point to be like, I'm just trying to get them to think critically so that they understand what they think as opposed to being able to spout what I think. And you know, that's why I kind of approach it that way. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer but that's, 
why I think about it that way. It's a great question. Excellent. Well, I see that we are very nearly at the end of our time, but Martina, why don't you please go ahead? Yeah, I mean, I was just wondering what the professor thought. I don't know, is it just me or are we at a moment where like the denial is so extreme? You know, that I think that in itself kind of makes for an interesting conversation. Um, you know, for example, it really struck me over the summer, um, you know, Bill Barr said essentially institutional racism doesn't exist, that there's no racism in our justice department. Nikki Haley said that America is not a racist country. I mean, I think something like just presenting that to our students and asking them, you know, what do you think about this? Um, is an interesting starting point. But yeah, it's really dangerous and I would only think do it with some of my classes. Um, but I don't know, is it just me? I don't, I don't recall seeing a level of denial in my lifetime, like the level that I see now. I'm curious what you think. I'm gonna be very brief because I know we're over time, but you know, I think there are plenty of examples from the 1950s of people mm -hmm. who made low bar-esque statements that I would <laughs> yeah. put up. And then what, the strategy I was actually gonna show you is called historical fingerprinting. And it's mm -hmm. for the actual seven characteristics of fingerprinting and ask students to apply that to history. So core, crossover, island, and bifurcation. Um, crossover is this question of, if we're looking at something in history, where have we seen this before or have we seen in our contemporary moment? So when we always look for crossover, inevitably, if I'm talking about, for example, J. Lindsay Allman, who closed Virginia public schools for a year, rather than see them integrated, who basically makes the same Bill Barr argument. Then if I ask students to go look for the crossover, inevitably somebody comes in and says, that's this, I didn't do it. You know what I mean? Or they'll go back to something we talked about earlier in class and they're like, that's this. You guys are thinking critically, that's what I want you to do. Why do you think that? Where do you see the comparisons? I'm just asking really good questions at that point. I'm asking them to interrogate that document. And as a co-interrogator, I'm sharing with them the idea that, you know, I, I'm not trying to be right. I'm just trying to get you to think and process what we're looking at and why this continues to be an issue, right? Um, the way I look at it, Martine, and it's, I, I, these have been, um, Academy for Teachers always lives up to its the hype because you guys are next level. Um, it's what the Supreme Court decides in Trot versus Dulles with regard to punishment. I was just on a, a program the other day about Dr. Seuss and I got this hate angry email from this woman afterward who's like, I can't believe that you're taking down Dr. Seuss. And I was like, did you listen to what I said on the program? Because all I said was that in 1956, the Supreme Court in Trot versus Dulles said that punishment should draw its meaning from evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of maturing society. We don't draw on quarter people anymore. We don't send people to the whipping post. And so it stands to reason that as the country matures, it should have the opportunity to revisit its monuments, its markers, its memorials, its symbols, its street names, its literature, that nothing should exist in perpetuity. And if the United States Supreme Court is saying that with regard to punishment, capital punishment, right? Like a guy getting the death penalty for draft dodging, um, it seems like an appropriate way for us to think about this in our contemporary moment. So I wrote this long email to the person and I sent it and she sent me an expletive back. So I, to your point, yes, I do believe that we are polarized. At the same time, the way I think about it is I want that email to be a time capsule. As educators, it's our duty to be the time capsule, to create the space where when people ask the question ultimately about what we were teaching and how we were getting young people to really process and think critically about this moment. We were creating a space for them to do that authentically um, without, and it's hard sometimes because again, there are days that I go in and I'm boiling and I would have to recalibrate and say, you know, my goal is to get them to think critically about this and to try to understand us in a different context as opposed to going in and just kind of, you know, and then the second part of that is what my students got really good at by the end of the year is they were beating me to the crossovers and that's fun. They were beating me. Like I was going and I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't. It. And they would come in and from the homework, we'd be on something else. And then I would just let them have that 15 minutes to run that conversation. And then I'd redirect to whatever content it is that we were purpose for that day. But sometimes those conversations were more intense and the, the students would be there. And I could just then moderate that conversation and remind them, what's your evidence for that? 
Where have we seen that before? Why are you making that comparison? Um, so-and-so, why don't you agree with that? Well, isn't this like, and then at that point, what I am then is kind of a, a referee, but I had to model for them how to do that. It's a great question, Martina. And again, I apologize because I'm way over time. And I, I promise next week I'll, I'll do a little bit more of the scaffolding and we'll just dump, jump in the deep end with you guys. But you've been great. Well, I, I'm so glad we have you back next week because clearly the conversation is just getting started here. So thank you so much, Yohuru. Thank you, teachers, for being here.